let's start with the first one. Um, Lex Friedman, which is this year's Swiftcom's square brackets. I will explain you why. So the first square bracket, the beginning one, is this one. Um, a little bit about Lex, it will be also the, the ending square bracket, so the very last session will be also Lex, which I found to be interesting to have the same speaker come back at the very end. Um, we met at NSCOM 2014. Um, I was there and uh, he gave uh, an amazing presentation which I found out to be funny. Uh, speaking about NSCOM 2014, um, I've never hidden that, that this conference is inspired by NSConf, and I don't know if you guys know what this is. Can anyone guess what this is? This is not a Swift. It's a Phoenix. And some of you might know that NSConf announced that they will stop, but I am sure that Scotty has some plan, involving or not whiskey, um, <laughs> and we'll be back. So I see it more as a Phoenix uh, coming back, so this is why. Um, see you soon, NSConf. Um, again, as I told you, Lex has um, done a very crazy talk, which I really like. Uh, he's done. He, he does also this daily Lex podcast. If you guys haven't heard, just hear it. It's very interesting. It's like being five minutes a day with Lex in his life, speaking about everything and nothing at the same time. Some days are more interesting than others. Um, there are actually some days where he actually has to s say that he has nothing to say, but he managed to say it five minutes long. Um, <laughs> which really is, 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 is kind of a skill. Um, so um, he sells, that's also the funny thing, among other things, Bits and Zoe, which Bastian being here and um, also Timo um, do. Um, so um, that's also funny that they, those guys get to uh, meet each other yesterday. Um, and um, you should check out his interview on SwiftConf. I did a, f a couple of interviews from other people and you learn stuff about uh, like, for example, where Lex uh, started with, those, with all this thing. Um, and um, that's pretty much um, all for now, except that I had still a to-do. And as things go with to-do, you forget to put them, the photo. So without further ado, let's welcome Lex Friedman. So hi, I'm Lex Friedman. Um, I do a daily podcast, but you don't have to listen to it, it's fine. Uh, my title right now is I'm the EVP of sales and development for a company called Midroll. It's a podcasting company. I'll give you the one minute story of how I ended up there. I worked for a series of internet companies. I was the first full-time PHP developer hired at MySpace uh, about 5,000 years ago. And that was as MySpace was growing and getting bigger. And then once News Corp bought it, um, I and several other people left and we co-founded a diet tracking startup called The Daily Plate. And there, I was the only full-time PHP developer. Um, and I was also the only community support person and the only product manager and the only everything. Uh, we sold that to a company called Demand Media. So I was working for my third internet company. Uh, and I started freelancing for Macworld on the side, where I was writing iOS app reviews and how-tos and op-eds for Macworld. And I started realizing as Demand Media was kind of flailing from business model to business model that I was having more fun doing the Macworld writing than I was working for this internet company. So I decided to go to Macworld full time and I was writing articles for Macworld full time and suddenly for the first time in my life I had a traditional nine to five job where I wasn't working 24 hours a day. And that freed me up to do a podcast so I launched a podcast with a friend of mine, Dave Wiskus. Uh, the show is called Unprofessional. Started selling ads for it. Then Mule said, the network that I was on, if you're gonna sell ads for your show, will you sell ads for the talk show? And if you're gonna sell ads for the talk show, will you sell ads for all 15 of Mule Radio Show? And then Marco said, well, if you're going to sell all those shows, will you sell ATP's ads? And then Boing Boing asked me to sell their ads. About three months after I sold my first podcast ad, I was representing 50 shows. Um, so at that point, I said, I either have to stop doing this because it's going to take too much time or do it full time. And it ended up that now I do it full time for this company called Midroll. I'm also the host of three podcasts, Turning This Car Around, which is about fatherhood, the Rebound, which is ostensibly about technology, and Your Daily Lex, which is about Lex Friedman. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about learning from Apple's mistakes. And I would say, yes, Apple does make mistakes, uh, but I want to acknowledge I'm playing fast and loose with my definition of the word mistakes today. Uh, I'm counting as mistakes some things that I think we would all agree are genuinely mistakes, but also things that some would say are mistakes, and Apple would probably disagree and say, no, those were fine decisions, they were not mistakes. But Apple can host its own conference talk instead if it wants to argue its side. I get to make the rules here. So 
learning from Apple's mistakes. And yes, Apple does make mistakes. <laughs> That's the hockey puck mouse. Someone, and we can probably all guess who, somebody thought that mouse looked like a good idea. Uh, it turned out, though, it sucked to use the hockey puck mouse. Uh, circular mice are difficult and uncomfortable to hold in practice. But it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. The important thing is how do you deal with them? How do you battle those mistakes? But just as important is recognizing when you've genuinely made one. Somebody at Apple birthed this thing and thought it was a good idea. To see reviewers in print, because probably that came out before there were a lot of online reviews, but to see reviewers in print and then to hear customers complaining about it had to have been very difficult for some of the folks in Cupertino. Because they designed it. They went through, I'm sure, many permutations of what the right shape and design and look would be. And they said, this is the one. This is the way this should look. And somebody approved it. Somebody built it. And then they shipped it. And fortunately, although Apple is a very confident company, they have the right mentality. Chiefly, that the customer is sometimes right. <laughs> That's Apple mentality. Not, not always. Certainly, the customer is definitely not always right. Sometimes the customer has a thing or two or 12 to learn, and Apple is happy to do the teaching as appropriate. But other times, Apple is wrong, and the customer really is right, and it's time to face facts. So about two years after this mouse launched, they pulled it from the shelves, and it was replaced by the Apple Pro mouse, which was a nice, normal, oblong, traditional mouse. Apple relented. They acknowledged, yeah, the hockey puck mouse stinks. There were literally accessory vendors, if you remember this, making little plastic doohickeys that you could snap onto the mouse to make it suck less. But so two years later, this uh, Apple Pro mouse was the new hotness. You can make decisions that you think are great, or become convinced are great, or have Steve Jobs tell you are great, but if your customers and or common sense start telling you that you were wrong, you have to fix it. And so I think here the lesson is clearly Apple put tons of effort into the hockey puck mouse, but they were able to say, you know what, this is not working. We tried it, it failed, so let's go to this regular shape instead. Let me talk to you about a different, a different kind of Apple mistake and a different way that they approached it. This would be the iPad's side switch. When the first iPad came out, it had that, or, that side switch, the hardware switch on the side, and it controlled orientation. If you turned it on, it locked it so that if you were reading in bed or lying down or whatever or watching video and the screen was rotating like crazy, you slide that switch and it's going to stay where it is. In iOS 4.2, in the initial developer betas, that switch's functionality changed. They made it so that now it mirrored the iPhone. It became a mute switch instead. And at that time, there was no preference. When the first iOS 4.2 betas came out, there was no preference to say, no, let it keep doing what it used to do. Let it keep being the orientation lock. There was nothing. So people emailed Steve Jobs and said, hey, I've heard in the betas you change what this switch does. Is there at least going to be a preference? And Steve Jobs took hand to keyboard and wrote back, no. <laughs> and some of the world's handsomest and most talented tech writers complained about that change. <laughs> and uh, that's me. And so I said, we need an orientation lock. We don't need a mute switch. This is crazy. Sure, there was the software option where you'd, at the time, double tap and then slide over and then hit the software. I didn't want that. I wanted the switch. This is the thing I need all the time. I don't need to mute my iPad very often. It's got the volume button. You can press and hold the volume. It goes all the way down. I need an orientation lock. And I was angry. But Apple did not relent. 4.2 comes out, and it did not have a preference. And then finally, in a successive release, they added this preference. Do you remember when iOS looked like that? But there it was, a preference, and there was much rejoicing. People were delighted. I switched that switch back to lock rotation right away. But something happened over time, and I think it was around the time of the launch of the iPad Mini. At some point, Apple's algorithms for rotation detection got smarter. I started noticing if I was reading Instapaper or watching Netflix and I was reclined on the couch or in bed, it wasn't getting the orientation screwed up nearly as often. And if it was, I kind of gave the iPad a little nudge and the orientation flipped back and it seemed to get, okay, you want it to be in this orientation in whatever position you're in right now. And at the same time, when I was watching Netflix uh, on the iPad, I was getting annoyed because notifications kept coming on, you know, with banners floating down, and they would duck the sound. They would mute the sound of the video I was watching for a second. I was like, this is really annoying. I wish there was a quick way I could mute the notifications that are interrupting my video watching experience. And then I was like, hey, you know, I'm gonna switch that button back to mute now. So my take here is I was wrong to want this preference, but Apple relented and added it anyway, and I think that was the right thing to do. 
Apple knew long before I did that the algorithm for orientation detection was improving, that I didn't need to access orientation lock nearly as often, and that it made more sense to have mute there quickly. But Apple realized that even if the customer is sometimes right, people are jerks, and we always think we're right. <laughs> so they added this feature, and I, call, I don't know if this next reference is going to play, you'll have to tell me, but I call this a pity feature. Um, if you don't know, because I don't know how popular he is here, that's Mr. T, and he often pities fools. But this is a pity feature. Whether Apple agrees with you or not, there are sometimes issues that really don't matter, and Apple can take pity on you, and I think that's the right thing to do, to say, look, this decision is clearly a matter of taste, it's okay for us to give a little. If you can chalk something up to a personal preference, then it's okay to make it a preference. And one thing I wanna really suggest to you today is that despite what you've been told, Adding a checkbox is not an admission of defeat. I know there's a very wise and smart kind of inclination to say not everything needs to be a preference. You don't want to have your app filled with preferences and uh, let everybody customize every single aspect of their experience, but you have to sometimes add a preference. It doesn't mean that you should never have preferences. You do want to give your user some amount of control, and it's okay to take pity when taking pity makes sense. But Apple doesn't always take pity, and it shouldn't. So here's another way that... Some would say Apple made a mistake, but this time they didn't take pity, and I think that they made the right decision there, too. And it's back to the same era of that hockey puck mouse. The original iMac, born in 1998, came with the crappy mouse, but this was also the first Mac without a floppy drive. And customers flipped out. We need floppy drives. How are we going to transfer files between computers? But Apple did not recant. And Apple, and people don't always believe me when I say this, but it's true, Apple did not make an external floppy drive. Third-party vendors stepped up and created USB floppy drives, but Apple did not offer one. Apple said, this is not a personal preference situation this time. This is the early recognition of a paradigm change. And so my take here is if you're making a change because you believe that the world is changing, you don't have to add a preference. You shouldn't add a preference. The hard part, the challenge for you, is figuring out, are you making a decision that's a preference. Is it a lock switch kind of situation where you can take pity and add the preference? Or are you changing the world? And in this case, they were saying floppy drives are a bygone era. We're going to be moving on. It's optical. They're nothing. Are you a world changer or a preference maker here? Is it a potential mistake or is this a necessary push? And I think that we would all agree it's okay for your decisions to be opinionated. You need balance. Don't make every decision for your users and don't make everything a preference either. Sometimes it's okay to to have very strong opinions. This is another reference. I don't know if it's going to translate, but we're going to try. If you're from the US, at least, you know that that's a very opinionated person. But here's a different example. Here's a time when Apple straddled the line between introducing a new concept, as it did with the iMac, but this time hedged its bets, saying, we recognize that for many of you, right now, this could be a mistake. The very first MacBook Air, when they ditched the floppy drive, Apple clearly felt confidence we're making the right decision. This makes sense to do, and we're going to drag you along kicking and screaming. We're not going to have a pity floppy drive. But with the MacBook Air, they ditched the super drive, and Apple felt a little bit less short of it, a, a little bit less sure of itself. So removing that optical drive from the MacBook Air felt more, or that DVD drive from that MacBook Air felt more like a necessity, but less like a true shift, a true world change at that moment. So this is a Mac that's meant to be super light and thin. It's not a computing powerhouse. But maybe it wasn't quite time for the DVD drive to go entirely. So this was introduced in 2008. But they still make plenty of computers, uh, well, they still make one or two computers that have a, a, a CD drive in them. And this is the new newer MacBook Pro with Retina display. The MacBook Air was training wheels for saying, you no longer need to have a DVD drive, a super drive. Not just for you, but also for Apple. So Apple got a bit more confident and removed that drive from Retina displays, but even today, Apple sells its own for $79 or for 79 euros, because Apple is not very good at math. Um, you can pick up an external USB super drive. It's an official Apple product, and this is what I would call hedging its bets. Apple's saying we can make our computers slimmer and thinner, but we're still gonna take some pity on you and give you this DVD drive, because we know you're probably still gonna need it. And if you look at the the just the straight MacBook, the one port MacBook today, <laughs> we were joking yesterday, you know, Apple obviously has to sell all kinds of accessories for that one because you're going to need to plug in more than one thing. You're going to need more than just that USB-C port. And it's another case where Apple's trying to make some changes, but acknowledging we're going to have to <laughs> make this transition a little bit simpler with some extra accessories. So let's review where we are. 
The hard part is figuring out what's a mistake and what's not. And the mistakes that we've talked about today, there are four kinds, four different kinds of mistakes and four different approaches to how Apple's handled them. There was the mouse, which was a mistake where Apple eventually said, we screwed up and we're going to give you a more traditional style mouse. There was the iPad, where they had that side switch, they changed it, and even though they really didn't need to change it back or to add that preference, they did, they took pity on us. There was the pity feature. There was the floppy drive where Apple said, we're going to give you some tough love. We're killing the floppy drive and you're going to deal with it. And then there was getting rid of the super drive where they did it much more slowly, much more cautiously, and they said, we're going to help you out. Here's an official Apple branded accessory to help you keep your super drive needs going along. So that's four ways to handle mistakes. But there are a couple others that I want to talk about other Apple mistakes. Now, some of these are going to be a little bit more controversial and some may be a little less so, but in all cases, Apple's reactions are good to study. I'm still bitter over iMovie, so I like to keep that as my first uh, example in this section. But iMovie 08 was the version of iMovie that switched from the beautiful, sweet, innocent iMovie of yore to whatever the hell this is. <laughs> and let me be clear, I was not a fan of Apple's new direction for iMovie back then, and it still hurts now. <laughs> but do you remember what Apple did when this version of iMovie came out? They kept iMovie 6 around when you installed the new iMovie, and they made iMovie 6 available as a free download at the same time. So this was another, just like when they said goodbye to the floppy drive, but in this case, Apple said, let's make it easier for our existing customers. iMovie 08 was part of iLife 08, iPhoto and GarageBand and the rest of the suite overwrote your previous versions. If you had previous versions of iMovie, I'm sorry, of iPhoto or GarageBand installed, Gesundheit, I speak German. Uh, if you had previous versions of those software installed, it, they, over, they got overwritten when you installed iLife 08, but not iMovie. iMovie 08 did not overwrite iMovie 6, 2006. They kept it around. It was put in a, a folder that said, you know, previous iMovie version. Apple knew in advance that some people would see this screen about as welcoming as they see this screen. <laughs> this, in this case, Apple saw a mistake coming in advance. They knew that for some folks, this iMovie switch was going to hurt like hell and be very unwanted and very unpleasant. There are times when you rip the Band-Aid off, like when they got rid of the floppy drive, and there are times when you just want to be held. With the, I know, those are my kids. Uh, so with the, <laughs> with the iMovie OA transition, Apple held us. Uh, I don't know how popular, how familiar you are with Kenny Rogers, but to sort of paraphrase Kenny Rogers regarding your customers, you have to know when to hold them and you have to know when to push them along. And with iMovie, Apple said, look, this is not going to work for everybody and we get that. So we're going to let you keep clinging to this old version. There's a, here's a more recent example of a mistake that Apple made. Another example of Apple realizing that not everybody's going to be comfortable with the changes they're trying to make in software and in software design particularly. This is iTunes 11. Now it's been around for a couple years, so maybe you're more used to it. But this is also iTunes 11. There's a preference that they don't even do, they don't even tuck it away. It's right there in one of the menus called Show Sidebar. And that one little menu option transforms the whole app between the new look and the old one. Let me see if I can go back again for a second. It takes, you know, this version, which really does not look like any of the iTunes predecessors very much at all, and it makes it look a lot more traditional. So that show side, whoops, spoiler, that show sidebar uh, isn't a cheat, and I don't think it means that, you know, we're ashamed of our new look and we're embarrassed about the new look. I don't think it's that. They're saying there's going to be a class of user that will curse you if you have changed what they want. Now, the truth is, anytime you change the design of anything, customers are going to complain. I think nobody knows this better, frankly, than Facebook. Every time Facebook redoes what uh, the login, you know, what the, the home screen looks like in Facebook, the news feed and everything else, there's an, out, an uproar from customers. And you'll see a bunch of groups get created that people start liking on Facebook, saying, bring back the old Facebook, I hate the new Facebook, and it gets 10 million likes. And Facebook, frankly, doesn't give a shit. Um, some customers are going to complain no matter what. When you change the look and feel of anything, people are going to complain. But this is a case where I think that Apple was smart and wise to say, we're changing this, and we're changing it for what we think is the better, but we know there are going to be customers who are going to object. And here's a way that we can, again, give them a kind of a Band-Aid, where we can make this transition a little bit less painful. There's not really different functionality in iTunes 11. It's really mostly a visual change from what came before it. So it's okay in that case to let your users hang on to the old option. I always think of this uh, Macworld editor who left Macworld to uh, 
join a, a software company called Many Tricks. His name is Rob Griffiths. And Rob is the quintessential hater of change. Uh, he has, if you Google, after my talk, not during somebody else's talk, if you Google um, Rob Griffiths Macworld iPhone, iPhone OS, he has this vicious editorial on Macworld from you know, 2008 where he's, I will never upgrade to iPhone 2.0, iPhone OS 2.0. He was disgusted with the changes Apple made. Why would they change these things that have worked so well? He's who I think of when I look at that show sidebar preference. This is clearly a feature for the Rob Griffiths, Rob Griffiths of the world uh, because they're going to hate it. They're going to object to every single change you do, and you have to find transition points for them to come along kicking and screaming. Here's another, I think, a, a quintessential Apple mistake. Uh, do you, if you've seen the show Silicon Valley, Apple Maps became a punchline just this past season, just in the past month or two, where software, a web company was being told they had made a pretty big mistake, and they said, how big a mistake was it? Was it, was it Apple Maps big? Uh, that's a pretty bad reputation for Apple to have. The first time I gave this presentation, I was in Ireland. And at the time, I wasn't sure ahead of time, was Apple Maps, was Apple Maps' launch? as big a problem, my notes here say shit show, was, was Apple Maps' launch as big a problem in Ireland as it was back in the United States. Quick Googling alerted me to this. I don't know how well that's going to show up, but there's a place in Ireland called Kulak, and if you look there, <laughs> Apple's map, Apple Maps got that wrong in just about the worst way possible, or the best way, depending on your perspective. But you know, Apple Maps had many problems, not just renaming towns with more profanity. Uh, you know, people got lost. The navigation would get you to the wrong places, uh, take you to the wrong addresses, and that's a big problem. And now, I don't know how many of you have ever been tech journalists besides me, but one of the highlights of anybody who's covering Apple, one of the best things that can happen to you is you get a statement from Apple on the record. It's very rare that Apple's PR machine will actually give you quotes. They're getting better about that now. Sometimes Apple executives even go on podcasts. But, you know, even a year ago, extremely difficult to get comment from Apple. And it, everybody was going to Apple for comments when Apple Maps came in, saying, you know, people are pretty miserable about this. These, they're getting lost. And I was the first person that Apple contacted to get back to. Everybody got the same quote, so I wasn't the only person. But they, Trudy Muller, who's one of their top PR people at Apple, reached out to me and gave me the quote, the more people use it, the better it will get. So just keep thinking that you now live in Coolcock, Dubliners, or you know, just keep getting lost for a while, keep following our crappy directions that take you to the wrong places, and over time it'll get better. That is not a good way to handle a mistake. Uh, it was really a surprisingly and uncommonly tone-deaf response from Apple, right? They said, just keep using it, it'll get better over time. The more, it's more crowdsourcing it, it's, it's a public live beta. Uh, not good. A couple days later, after that response did not go over very well, Tim Cook publishes an open letter on Apple.com to his customer, an apology letter. He says, we're sorry. We know this isn't good. We know it's not working. And he, again, they doubled down a little bit. He says, the more our customers use our maps, the better it will get. But he also says, we are extremely sorry. And he goes beyond. He says, while we're improving maps, you can try alternatives by downloading map apps from the App Store like Bing, MapQuest, and Waze, or use Google or Nokia by going to their websites and creating an icon. This is before Google Maps even existed in the App Store. So, pause. Apple is much, much richer than you. I don't know everybody's bank accounts, but I'm positive. Apple has way more money than you. Apple can afford to say, we screwed up and we screwed up so much, go use our competitors instead. I'm not suggesting you need to do that. I'm not suggesting you should encourage your customers to go use your competitors' products. But to me, the takeaway here is that open and honest communication with your customers regarding issues reflects well on you. You want to be a good listener. And Apple, Apple honestly needs to learn this lesson a lot, and they're getting better at it. But you need to respond quickly. I love Apple's message there, Tim Cook's letter, not just for its endorsement of Google and Microsoft, but because they're saying, we're aware of the issue, but it's going to take time to fix. So we're working on it, but it's not ready yet. And to me, that's huge. I mentioned at the start of my talk that I worked for this company called The Daily Plate. There were three co-founders. The other two guys held down full-time jobs so that they could pay me something. In exchange, they, when we sold it, they became millionaires and I did not. But I'm not bitter. But so, when I, I was the only guy working on the Daily Plate full-time. It was a diet-tracking website. It was before, you know, the, it was before iOS. And it was before um, 
lose it and MyFitnessPal, but it's the same concept. But I was in charge of everything. I did all the web development. I did all the design, and I am terrible at design. I did all the product development and customer service, and I was on the forums each day interacting with customers. And they would give me bug requests, and our customers used the sites in a way that we didn't. We all probably should have been tracking what we ate and trying to lose weight, but we weren't, and our customers were. And so they would have to log into the site, and we had this big green button on every food item in our database that said, I ate this. So you would search for the food you had, and you'd click the I ate this button and say, okay, here's how many calories and carbs and whatever else you've had today. And so a lot of customers would come to us and say, look, every day I have to go and search for the bread and say, I ate this, and I had two servings. Then I had to search for the peanut butter and say, I ate this, and I had one serving, and I had to start search for the jelly and said, I ate this. It'd be great if we could group those together. And I said, yes, of course it'd be great if you could group those together. I'm an idiot for not having implemented that already, but I saw that feature request on the forum. And we built what we called meals, which were groupings of food. And then you could say, okay, here's what my sandwich looks like, and add it as a meal. And you hit one button, and it added all the individual elements of that meal. That's kind of a no-brainer feature, but we had no brains, and we didn't add it until our customer suggested it. But other times, our customers would say, we want you to do this feature. And they meant, we want you to do this feature. But other, well, so occasionally, when they said, we want you to add this feature, what they really meant was that a different feature was too confusing or not intuitive enough, or that the feature was too hard to find. And part of what, what I had to do was triage what do they really mean when they're saying they want this feature. On occasion, they had good or even bad ideas that would take a while. So if it was a bad idea, I would post back on the forum and say, thank you for that feature request. Here's why we're not going to do it right now. And sometimes, you know, they'd still be angry and say, no, you should really add this thing. Like, I want to have video chat supported on the daily plate. Well, no, we're not going to do it. And here's why, it's because you know, the site crashes every day at lunchtime anyway when everybody's locking their lunch, we're not gonna add even more bandwidth consuming features. And people appreciated, even if I said no, that I was taking time to respond to them. On other occasions, they had really great feature request ideas, and I would say, look, that's a really good idea, or point out bugs, and I'd say, yes, you're right, that's broken. It's going to take time to fix it. We're working on it, I've put it on the list. Eventually, we started publishing the list. Here's all the things we're working on. And they could see, right on the site, what Lex was working on that day and what was probably a month away, what new feature requests were there. And people ate that stuff right up, and then they had to log it. But so telling your customers that you're hearing them, even if you're saying, I'm working on the problem and I don't have an answer yet, is almost as good as fixing them. Customers want to feel heard. It's way better than staying completely silent until you have the fix ready. And that's what Apple used to do, right? Some versions of iOS, there was one that was really crashy. You would just keep getting the white screen of death, and people said, you know, Apple hasn't said anything about this. What's the problem? And Apple waited way too long to say, yes, there's a problem, and we're going to put out a release. Even if it's going to take time to make a fix, don't stay silent. You have the fix ready. Tell your customers you're working on it. Here's another more recent example, sort of, recent-ish. It ends recently, but it starts a while ago. <laughs> Perhaps you remember Ping. If you do remember it, I'm very sorry. Uh, it was a difficult time for all of us. Ping was announced in September 2010 as an exciting social network for music, music fans and musicians, and it stank. It was terrible. In large part, the problem was, was the social network built into a store, um, the iTunes store, uh, and it was much, much less fun and much less usable than Twitter or Facebook, and it was a mistake. It didn't work, and eventually Apple said, we're going to shut it down. Almost exactly two years after it launched, Apple said, we're going to shut it down, and then they did. And I'm fine with that. I'm even fine with the fact that Ping got two years. When you're going to try to build a social network, you obviously you need to give it time to have people come there. Dating sites know this better than anybody, right? For a dating site to work, it's not even about having the best features. It's about having the, the most attractive people. It's about having lots and lots of people so you have the better chance of making matches. You can't launch a social network and say, three months later, it didn't work. Let's shut it down. It takes some time for people to get there. And I'm OK with the fact that Apple gave it two years. But two years was enough suck, and so at that point, Apple pulled the plug. And that could have been the end of the story, and it would have been fine. But if you remember the most recent keynote, this is Connect, which is part of Apple Music, which is launching at least in the US later this month. It remains to be seen whether this Connect feature for artists is going to be a mistake or not, but it shows a lot of learning. This is Apple saying, you know what? The features that let artists interact with their fans made sense. We shouldn't try to build another true social network that's going to let our that's going to let music fans interact with each other because they've got places to do that already. We're not going to move to inside iTunes to interact with each other. 
We're going to do that on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else. Maybe not on app.net. But we're going to keep finding places to interact that are outside of Apple. But here's a place that's not in a store. Now it's a social network for artists to share with us, and it's while you're listening to music versus while Apple's trying to get you to buy more stuff. It's kind of like a Tumblr for musicians. I think this is a, a case where Apple learned from its mistakes and was patient enough to say, we know we had something a little bit cool here with Ping. Let's wait until we can find the right opportunity in the right place to do it. It's a pretty impressive, a pretty impressive way to go. So what have we learned? One, that I'm very charming up here, but two, don't fall in love with your ideas. If you ship a mistake, you have to be able to recognize it and you have to be able to fix it. Take pity on your customers. There's nothing wrong with a pity feature. If it's a matter of personal preference, make it a personal preference. If you're changing the world, you should stick with your decision. You can kill the floppy drive and that's okay. You don't have to make that easy. But you have to trust that you're truly changing the world and not making what could potentially be a mistake. It's okay to be cautious if you think you're changing the world, but you're not positive. It's okay to hedge your bets. No user will complain that you made life a little bit easier for them. No customer has ever said, why did you make this change so easy on me? If you know in advance that some people are going to say, this is a big mistake, do yourself a favor and do them a favor and let them cling to the past a little bit longer. <laughs> Acknowledge your problems, listen well, and communicate quickly, but have a good answer. <laughs> Instead of saying, it'll get better if you keep suffering, to be able to say, we're aware of the problem and we're working on it and we're going to try to make this better for you over time. Here's alternatives in the meantime. Let, the, let your customers know you're hearing them. <laughs> Never launch ping. Uh, and it's okay if you're not sure if you've made a mistake. The lesson of ping really is that it's okay to wait. It's okay to take a little bit of time and say, I'm going to give this a fair shot. And if you need to take your time fixing that mistake, that's okay too. Everybody makes mistakes. It's really important and it's good to learn from your own. It's way more fun learning from somebody else's, especially when it's somebody as big as Apple. Thank you very much. I'm Lex, and I appreciate your time. All right, I'm back. Thank you, Lex. My awesome. Pleasure. That was awesome. You get to win one of those objective cologne cups. This there. It's oh, a, cool. Thank you. It's a, well, but take this one. It's I a, will. It's, an, it's historical. <laughs> it's like I probably have still a few of those. <laughs> and uh, you can stick here because uh, oh, we questions. can actually, yeah, Q&As. Um, does anybody have a question? Otherwise, I would have a few questions, but the priorities is for you guys. Uh, we will jump with the microphone. I'll start with one. Um, which is, uh, first of all, I would love to, to, to visit this place in Ireland, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I'm not going to pronounce the name. Uh, but um, I was thinking about um, um, this Connect thing, which kind of replaces Ping, so to say. And what's your impression of, on this? Is it going to work at all? Because my impression is that it's gonna pro most probably going to fail the same way. Uh, I think that's a fair guess, that it would yeah. fail the same way. Where I think it has a better shot now is that like, it looks like Pharrell is going to release an album exclusively yeah. on Apple Music first. I'm sure it'll be available everywhere eventually, the same way you know that Apple had HBO Now in the U.S. first, and then everybody else got it a couple weeks later. But when, you know, Pharrell is a huge artist, right? His annoying song, Happy, is heard and known by everybody in the planet. But when he releases a new album, I think it'll do well. And if he has behind the scenes video or footage, or if he can show like early drafts of his lyrics, I don't know what he's gonna do, but if he has that kind of info, there is a certain level of Pharrell enthusiast who I think will eat that stuff up. But the real question is, are artists going to, or their labels going to be willing to put in the time to generate and share that kind of content? Because if, if all it is is you know a random blog post from an artist, no, I don't think that's gonna really catch on. Okay. But if they can get Lady Gaga to share lyrics from an upcoming album or, you know, here's abandoned drafts of a song. I think that could, I think that has a chance of being popular, especially, I think it's a big deal that it's not in a store anymore. Yeah. I'm thinking about somebody else, by the way, which is Taylor Swift. Uh, but, uh, yes. <laughs> I named this conference because of her. Yes. Uh, the conference obviously. is named after um, Taylor Swift. Go ahead. Grab the mic. Hey. So my question is uh, regarding... Uh, music and, the, and, uh, and what Apple is trying to build. Um, so I see a lot of similarities between um, the move to streaming, like Spotify, Apple, and stuff like that. And um, so you would purchase songs before, 
actually would purchase albums and you purchase songs and now you could stream and artists are getting less and less money for the same thing. In software, we sell software for a large price because it's boxed and everything and then we sell software for a small price because people expect that for a tiny phone and then there's streaming for software so you would subscribe and then you get all the software you can eat. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm always happy to make predictions that will be proven laughably wrong later. Um, Me too. I think that streaming or subscription for software is inevitable. And I don't think it's going to happen overnight, and I don't think it's going to be one of those, let's rip out the floppy drive and now everything is there, but I think that Apple will, over time, start allowing developers to initially opt into such a plan, and that it'll be a revenue share kind of approach. For artists, it's a little bit easier. Taylor Swift pointed out pretty publicly that you know, even, even when they're getting paid for that three-month free trial, and even when artists are getting paid by their labels for all the streaming, it's very little money. Uh, and so artists today are finding that they have to get popular on the streaming services and on radio, and then they can tour, and that's where they make the real money. Touring is extremely high margin for them and very profitable. Uh, it's also a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> The closest thing developers have right now is conferences. So every single one of you should go launch a conference, and that's how, like, stuff is like a millionaire now from this. Um, As everybody I can, knows. I can also attest to that. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> but, it, no, I mean, the truth is, it's, I think it's a thing to be conscious of or thinking about, but not to be nervous about. Because Apple's not going to do it in a way, Apple's not going to make that change unless they think it's sustainable. And sustainable not for the company, but for its developers, right? Because if everybody says, this doesn't work and I'm making less money than ever, nobody's going to keep developing for iOS. It wouldn't make sense. But I think that at some point, it, music I think is a tougher streaming offer than most other things. Like many of us are comfortable with Netflix or other kind of streaming services. But then with music, a lot of us have clung for a while to buying. Very more, many more people are buying from iTunes today than are subscribing to Spotify. But I think it's going to change. Chris Breen, who used to work at Macworld and now works at Apple, is the one who convinced me to get into streaming music right before Apple announced Apple Music. So now I'm a Rhapsody customer. But you know, once you make that change, it makes a ton of sense. And if they can come up with the right price points and you, know, you get X number of apps at this price and Y number of apps at this price, I think it could end up being lucrative for developers over time. The only, uh, if I may follow up, the only Please. thing that I remember recently is uh, the developer share that uh, app.net had. So you would pay app.net for the social network and then they would redistribute a part of, your, of their income to developers and people would vote on which app would get that. So if you're talking about revenue share, I have a few apps, but they're so tiny in overall that I'm going to get pennies on the dollar, essentially. Right. It's is, is what I I'm mean, worried about. I, and I think, it's, I think it's the right thing to have concern about. Um, but like I say, like, I don't think Apple wants to lose your apps. And even if they're tiny, if you've got happy customers, they're going to want to find a way for you to be compensated fairly. I don't know what that is. Fortunately, they're way smarter than I am. I hope. If anybody has a question, just uh, let us know. In the meantime, I have one. Um, let's leave Pink and Taylor Swift uh, for a while and uh, go to the, um, the mistakes in th themselves, like, like uh, Apple Maps and all that stuff. My impression is that since the Tim Cook era, and don't get me wrong, I mean, much respect and lots of love for Steve, uh, it's, um, we, I tend to hear Apple apologize e easier and more often, like Tim is, is somebody who can actually more say, we screwed up, whereas at the time of Steve, he was always right, right? What do you think about that? I think you're right. I think it's easier and more comfortable and natural for Tim to say we are human and capable of making mistakes, and that Steve did not want Apple to be human. Steve wanted it to be something that is greater than human, but it's staffed by humans. The one example that I don't use that sometimes people ask about is uh, Antenna Gate with the original iPhone 4. Right, the 4? You're holding it wrong. Yeah. And Apple had a press conference where they said to address what many attacked as a mistake. And I think in retrospect, the press got it wrong. I think in retrospect, it wasn't really a big issue. Clearly, most people did not return those phones. They used them for years. They worked. It happened to have a spot like every other spot where signal attenuation could occur if you touched it where the antenna was. Apple's biggest mistake, which Steve eventually acknowledged, was they put a little seam there. So it was like, a, put your finger right here and see what happens. And the answer was it made your signal get a little bit worse. Um, but that event was obviously very difficult for him. If you read the um, Becoming Steve Jobs book, they talk about how he was 
hysterical, like sobbing as this story was happening, that the, A, that the press was getting it wrong and that Apple was being attacked. It was like, you know, of course we're not going to ship a product that we think has this, you know, gigantic mistake and this is a, it's, it's not as big an issue as people are making it. It's not fair to us, whatever. Um, so he took it very personally, I think, but uh, it's, it's maybe a useless thought exercise because you'll never know. But if that had happened in the Tim Cook era, first, people would have said, well, look, Apple is doomed without Steve Jobs. But then second, how would Tim Cook have responded to it? I don't know. Like, the Steve Jobs press conference was a little bit adversarial. It was, yeah, there's a problem if you touch the phone here, but look, here's how Samsung phones work if you touch them here, and here's how this other company's phones touch, work if you touch them here. And it was like, it was taking the fight right back to them, where I could imagine Tim Cook saying, you know, you're right, we're sorry, and maybe ending just at, we're gonna offer these bumper cases to you for free if you want them, which eliminate the problem entirely. Not taking that extra step of saying, and screw you, all the other guys have problems too. <laughs> But you're, you're definitely, it's, it's a different company under Tim Cook yeah. in many ways in terms of how they react and interact. And uh, I think you're right that it's easy for them to apologize to. But again, um, I would argue that it's kind of a better company. But um, 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 yeah, I forgot what I wanted to say. I wanted to say something else, but uh, eventually. Oh, a question back eventually here, like. back. Yeah, go ahead. Question? Yeah. Uh, just use the microphone. Um, I'm saying I'm just carrying around the microphone to if someone has a question, I'm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, all right. Yeah, no. I thought you actually had that's a, question. a great question. That's that's Rene, my colleague, my iOS uh, other developer that I was telling you about you guys yesterday, um, and um, yeah. So um, we we're gonna do a break in like a minute. I I just wanted to thank the the Boeing's guys again for being here with Boeing's TV and a lot of cameras, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I wanted also to thank every single of you who actually came to me this morning and asked if they could help. It's all it's all it's always very cool. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, um, um, there, there is a little mistake that I saw Marcel's talk this, this afternoon in the schedule. It's not half an hour, it's just going to be a regular talk, like uh, as much time as he needs, like three quarter or whatever. So uh, we still have, we can, it's okay if we're still a little bit after five here. Uh, but in the meantime, I would say it's guys, it's, it's a good time now to get out and get some fresh air and uh, get some drink and, and have a network a little bit. And uh, thank you, Lex, again. And a round of applause for Glex. Thank you. You will see him again, anyways. Yeah.